Uh, I'm really pleased to welcome uh, Louis Prieto, uh, the director of Shattered, which is uh, now playing in select theaters and available on demand. Um, Louis, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Excellent. Um, the movie tells the story of Chris, who is a tech millionaire who's going through a divorce, and he winds up wheelchair bound due, due to an injury, and he's taken care of by a new acquaintance named Sky. Uh, things go horribly wrong. And uh, in addition to being a really intense thriller, uh, Shattered also has a lot of subtext about capitalism. Now, I understand that you earned an economics degree before becoming a filmmaker. And I wonder, did that background compel you to direct David Lowry's screenplay? Um, I wouldn't say it was determined to making the decision of making this film. Um, I, I should also say, you know, uh, just for the for clarity, I never finished my degree in economics. I oh. sort of dropped it after two years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but I got an idea of what it meant, the world of uh, econ you know, economics and capitalism. So I will say, uh, when I read the script, that was not, well, probably was one of those things that, you know, in addition to that, it has also that level, the fact that it makes a statement about where we are today and what is the, the essence of the two, uh, let's say, bad guys of the movie, quote unquote. So I think that that was another layer in, in the film. And personally, I like films that they have many layers. So if uh, you're watching the film and you just want to have a good time, you just have a good time. If on top of that, you feel like being a little bit uh, thoughtful and you want to read a little bit more, you find the elements to read more. And I think this film has those elements there. And, and yes, there is a beautiful scene between Frank Grillo and Cameron Monaghan uh, where they talk a little bit, they have and they have not. And I think that's what you're referring to. And uh, it is, a, it, you know, I, I think it's a great scene that makes you think a couple of things. You know, there are a couple of other things, uh, great lines of dialogue between, I, I won't say the lines, but anyway, between uh, Sky and uh, the character Frank Grillo also that are pretty funny about, you know, or the world will relate. Yeah, and I think that also carries through well with the visual language of the film. This, you know, this kind of the high house up on the hill, and then there's the a motel that's sort of down in the in the village. Um, I don't want to give anything away, but it seemed like this was kind of thematically woven into almost every corner of of the movie. Um, one of the things I loved about Shattered was it plays almost like an update of Rob Reiner's Misery. Um, it's not a remake. It has its own voice and its own rhythms. But I wonder, were you conscious of that movie while you were making your film? And if so, how did you steer away from similarities? Well, I, I was definitely conscious because when I read the script, I felt like, wow, uh, this, this reads, as, you know, it's, it reads great. It's a great script and reminds me of one of my favorite movies, Misery. So inevitably, uh, it came to my mind in a positive way, because at the same time, uh, the script of Shattered felt like it was very different, obviously, shared many elements, um, like most scripts shared with Shakespeare in a way. <laughs> um, but at the same time, it had many, uh, many new elements. So it felt like it is a different movie. It's not the same movie. So actually, I was not concerned. I was rather not concerned about, uh, how do you say, like, you know, being too close to it, because it has nothing to do with it. In fact, what I wish it was, I hope I can be closer. I hope I can make uh, the character of Lily uh, Skies get an Oscar like, you know, <laughs> Bates got in that movie, you know? Uh, I was looking for that, for example, in the performance. That was the biggest reference of Misery was actually in the performance, like to make sure that, especially for the character of, um, the, of Sky, to keep that level of, um, how can I say, of intensity, being so sweet and then all of a sudden tune and be the meanest person in the world. Um, so anyway, that, it, it was great to have that. There was something that I could study and see, like, who can I, how can I learn from the masters? You know? Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the casting because it really is spot on throughout, you know, like all of the different parts, um, particularly Lily Krug. Uh, she brings a unique kind of mania to that character. But many of the characters exhibit a sort of <clears throat> razor thin duality and I wonder was it difficult to cast these parts and in the case of the veteran actors like John Malkovich and Frank Grillo um, how much did you allow them to play versus perhaps sticking to what was written strictly on the page? Well when one works with actors uh, of the level of uh, John Malkovich and Frank Grillo you know you feel really lucky uh, because already you're bringing a lot to the table you know and 
they were both amazing. Uh, we, we both of them, you know, we talk about what was in the page and then it, the, those parts, they only grew, you know, they will just throw something in. Uh, it will be amazing, you know, and, you know, it was, although they're both very different actors, it was just the same process with both of them, you know, each take was a slightly different. There was something new that kept the scene fresh. And, you, you know, it was always like, oh, God, this is better than the previous one. Like, wait, but this one is even better, you know. So it only kept getting better. So um, working with John Markovich is one of the things that one has, uh, like, you know, like wish to do one day in, in, in your life as a director. And, uh, and I was so lucky, you know, to have him in the film. And every minute in the set with him, I felt that there was something growing because he's just an amazing actor. But I have to say also between takes and... Outside of the set, like in the evenings, you realize that in addition to being a great actor, he's also an, an incredible person, really generous uh, with everyone, with the rest of the cast, with the crew, with myself. So it just one feels extremely lucky just to, to, to make a film with someone like John Markovich. And uh, with Frank Grillo, it's a little bit the same. You know, it's all with a lot of energy that really when he's on set, he really lights up the show. Um, and just bring a very special uh, energy. So again, you know, we'll be shooting a scene and then all of a sudden he would bring something that you didn't expect and it would be like, wow, you blew my mind again. <laughs> two, two kind of behind the scenes questions. One, did, did Malkovich pick out that jacket that he wears? Because there's something that tells me that he did. <laughs> well, here is the, the theme. So with the custom designer, we look at different options. And I have to say, we have like maybe three jackets. That was the ugliest one. And I told the production designer, unfortunately, he won't go for that one because it's too much, but I love it. No, what was my surprise when Malkovich saw the three jackets? He said, well, it's definitely that one, isn't it? So. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And then the other one is, I just got to ask about Frank Grillo's hair. It's amazing, and he just has his own look. Did he? Does he do like hair and all that stuff on set, or do you just show up and that's just it? Just is how it is. No, no, no. He does his look. I mean, and, and again with this wardrobe, you know, we, we wanted to create something uh, peculiar for him, something that he hasn't done, or we didn't feel like he was the image of Frank Grillo. So no, I mean, he might look like Frank Grillo because he's Frank Grillo, but you know, we sort of like you know made that look. Um, all right, so Shattered is also surprisingly violent and sexually explicit, and mm -hmm. that's not a criticism, but I just wonder, did you direct it as a throwback or as a reaction to the kind of watered-down thrillers that we've seen a lot of in recent years? Well, I didn't think that much about any of that, in the sense that uh, I just read the script and interpreted it while it was there. Uh, Regarding the violent scenes, it is true that when you're doing a violent scene, you can go many ways. Um, in other films, I have gone in different ways. And in this one, for some reason, it felt like, you know, Clockwork Orange was also a movie that resonated uh, in my head when I was making it. And it felt, you know what? I think here there is a space for that. Uh, maybe because there is also light moments in the movie. Maybe because there is an element of comedy, if you want, in the movie, within the thriller, within the drama. And it felt that you could you could have those moments that you could shock everyone the same way that the protagonist was getting shocked. So it just felt natural um, in a way to go that way. And you know there is an interesting balance between violence uh, that is gratuitous and violence that is not. And in this case in the film, you know where you are in every moment. So it didn't feel like uh, we were pulling a cheap trick, if you know what I mean. You know, it felt like that was. It felt like this is what it needs to get to be done in this scene. Well, I was going to say it, it felt very inventive, even if as it was intense. There's a bit in the climax where, not to give anything away, but there's this sort of a crab walk with two characters that I didn't understand what I was looking at. <laughs> but it was just, you know, once I kind of I rewound, I cheated and I went back and I looked at it again. I was like, that's that's amazing. Well, I'm glad you rewind. That's something interesting. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, and just to finish, regarding the sex scenes, it's kind of like the same, you know, I mean, this basically, without telling too much about the movie, uh, you know, getting the specifics, this is about a guy who falls deep in love with a girl and is the most intense love, passionate love that you can have. So 
there is a little bit of basic instinct in that sense. You know what I mean? You have this, this wild sex and you can't talk about wild sex without showing the wild sex. Or, and it's not that it's explicit, you know, you don't, you know, I think the movie is very polite if you want, you know, so in the sex scenes, but it does tell you, you know, uh, this is hot, you know, there is stuff going on here. We're not trying to be, how can I say, like, oh my God, you know, like I'm afraid of showing this or showing that. Like, no, no, this is, this is what people do. This is real life. And, you know, again, you know, it's very, I think it's very well shot. It's very beautiful to watch. Uh, but again, if you look at the art, you know, and I'm talking from Italy right now, everyone is naked. All the sculptures are naked. You know, it's the beauty of the human body. So there is nothing to, to be scandalized about that. Well, speaking of art, and this is my last question, um, there's a painting in the movie that is attributed to Picasso. And it's such a striking image that I went and I looked it up after I watched the movie. And I realized there's a bit of deception on the part of the screenplay and possibly one of the main characters in the film. Was this in the original script or was this something that you kind of developed as some of the visual themes came together in the movie? You, you mean the, who is the painter regarding the painter of that? Painting? Yes. Yeah. All right. It's, so this this is a tricky thing. Um, it's one of those things that sometimes you have to uh, tiptoe and construct. The reason it is in the script it was always um, a painting by Picasso because it has you know for many reasons. Everyone knows who is Picasso and the style is very specific and all that. But at the same time, there is a, the re the reality check. You cannot feature Picasso artwork. It's just there is no way the Picasso state is going to allow you to do that in a movie. So what we figure out is that we could feature a painting of another Spanish painter, Juan Gris, that is actually a portrait of Picasso. So that is what is in the movie. And when uh, the character of John Malkovich asks the character of Cameron, is that what is that? Uh, Cameron says, you know, uh, Chris says is basically a portrait of Picasso. It doesn't say that it's a Picasso. So I think that's the part that, you know, um, again, you might feel like, well, wait a second, is that really a Picasso? No, we never say that it was a Picasso. Looks like a Picasso, because it's also a Cubist painting, but it's actually a portrait of Picasso by Juan Gris, and not another amazing painter, Spanish painter. Yeah, it, it was, again, uh, so many layers to this movie. And uh, congratulations uh, on Shattered. Thank you so much for taking some time to talk with me. And uh, yeah, I hope people discover this, you know, on demand and, and playing in theaters. So thank you very much, Luis. Thank you, Ian. And apologies for the technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Uh, good luck with the, rest of the, uh, with the rest of the day. All right. Thank you. Cheers. All right. Take. Bye. -bye. bye.